I think my room and your room are very similar. <laughs> I <think so. laughs> I it doesn't surprise me. <laughs> no, not me. <laughs> yeah, you both look like you're you're uh, coming alive from a you know revolutionary bunkers or something. <laughs> it's a good look. That was what I was aiming for. <laughs> Well, we appreciate that. You know me, that's, that's definitely Miko's style. Um, so hello and welcome to the audience. Um, welcome to another installment of Miko's uh, ongoing webinar series. I'm Jamil and I'll be introducing today's event. The, the name of today's event is Theater and Film in Palestine with Sarah Bakri and Gael Hanan. Um, this is a discussion about theater in Palestine and Israel. Um, it's about censorship of the arts, uh, inequity in funding, and what it's like to work in the film and theater industry in Palestine and Israel. So it's my pleasure to introduce uh, our, our panel today. Uh, first, we have uh, Guy Al-Hanan. Uh, Guy wrote his PhD on bilingual and Arabic theater practices and teaching possibilities. He is a playwright, a director, actor, and lecturer who specializes in multicultural and interdisciplinary stage work, including music, mime, and puppetry. Some of his work includes Mars at Sunrise, The Time That Remains, The Attack, and, and there's many others I'm sure we'll, we'll discuss at, at different points in the, in the uh, discussion today. And then uh, our second guest uh, today is Saleh Bakri. He is a pa uh, Palestinian film and theater actor. He began his uh, career in the theater, actually, and his work includes uh, Death in the Maiden, Salt of the Sea, When I Saw You, the Time That Remains, Wajib, and, 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 uh, and many other films. So thanks to both of you so much, Guy and Saleh, for your time and participation today. We really appreciate it. Um, Thank you, Jamil. Yeah. Before I hand things over to Miko, I just, uh, you know, remember we're live streaming this to Facebook. So uh, if you want to share this event with somebody else, you can uh, go to facebook.com slash Miko Pellet Official and uh, hit the share button. Uh, we also make all of these webinars available to watch uh, at mikopella.com. So look for that in a, in a day or two. And um, in about an hour, we'll, we'll try and move towards the audience Q&A after the discussion wraps up. So uh, use the Q&A button in the Zoom toolbar at the bottom of the screen to submit your question for uh, either of the panelists. And I think that's going to do it for me. Uh, I'll hand it over to Miko to get the discussion started. All right. Thank you, Jamil. And thank you to the audience uh, that's still uh, kind of uh, streaming in. Um, just a uh, disclosure, Guy is my nephew. And uh, his mother, Nurit, was on a, on a panel that we did um, way back about the Israeli, um, about racism in the Israeli education system. And so that was a very interesting panel, too, with other educators. And so I invite people to go. It's available on micopella.com. Um, and so thank you both, Salah and Guy, for your time and for willing, thank you, uh, being willing to talk about this. Um, there's, when, when people, the, the, I think one of the biggest problems about Palestine is that when people talk about Palestine, they always talk about the same thing. They talk about the West Bank and Gaza, they talk about Hamas and Fatih, um, and that's kind of it. And from time to time, there's a movie that comes out that becomes famous and people watch and, and talk about for a while. And then they go back to talking about all this other stuff. Um, and I think it's, uh, I think it's important to talk about the stuff that happens. Well, first of all, to consider all of Palestine as Palestine, but also to talk about other aspects of life in Palestine. Now, there is this myth that I touched on in, with other panelists in the past that Israel is this wonderful democracy that uh, the Palestinian citizens of Israel enjoy full uh, equal rights, that Israel is uh, this uh, liberal democracy that is a uh, shining light. And uh, nobody really knows about the inner workings, the day-to-day -day life, what it means to be a Palestinian artist, a Palestinian actor, or to work in that realm. And so I really thought that the two of you would be a great, uh, you know, the two best people really to talk about this. Thank you so much. And, and so I thought maybe let's just make, keep it really simple. Maybe I'll just ask you guys to talk about your background, where you grew up, how you started uh, in theater and so on. Maybe Guy, you want to go first? Sure. So um, 
Um, I was born in Jerusalem, West Jerusalem. Um, I'm 41 years old. I have two kids, married, living in Haifa. Uh, just a correction for Jamil, I did not uh, do my um, PhD yet. I just started it this year. I have two more years, and that is in uh, Exeter University in England. Um, of course, I'm still in Haifa, and this is happening online. Um, my uh, brief history in two minutes would be that I, um, after spending two years and 10 months in the Israeli army, I managed to finally uh, get out. Um, I went uh, abroad um, with the uh, complete um, um, understanding that I will never come back. Um, I spent uh, a year in the United States, uh, some time in Cuba, learning languages, and eventually got to Paris to study theater, pantomime and, the and theater. And I stayed there for six years. Um, and what brought me back actually was uh, studying Arabic. I studied Arabic in the French university, um, literary Arabic. And um, that what made me uh, feel um, a very strong um, connection to the country, maybe for the first time. Um, and a connection to my own identity, to the Hebrew identity, which I completely uh, hated by then, uh, was completely uh, um, annexed by the army for me and by the state. I, I, I couldn't uh, hear that language anymore. And it came back to me thanks to the Arabic. So uh, in the past uh, 10 years, um, um, I came back to uh, Palestine, Israel, and the past 10 years I've been um, mainly uh, practicing and teaching theater in Arabic and cinema um, and in Hebrew, but uh, mainly centered in the periphery of uh, Haifa in the north and uh, keeping out of the center uh, of Tel Aviv and the television, stuff like that, the Israeli industry. Um, I find that what happened, what's happening in the north of Palestine in terms of culture, uh, fascinating. Um, yeah, I see someone asked about the Maim Marceau. So, um, yeah, yeah, pretty much the same school <laughs> of pantomime. It was a long time ago, though. So that's basically me. Um, I uh, teach in the college. Um, I teach theater in Arabic for BA students. This is something that uh, doesn't really exist in Israel very poorly. Uh, high education in general doesn't exist in Arabic in Israel. There's no college or university that teaches in Arabic. Uh, students are obliged to study in Hebrew in most colleges, certainly in acting schools. And what I'm teaching acting in Arabic is something that maybe exists in one other college um, but is uh, constantly a victim of censorship and closing down, defunding. So uh, for me, teaching um, acting in Arabic in a college that doesn't have theater department, I'm teaching uh, education and uh, law students um, to, um, to stand in front of an audience and the, main, the real basics of uh, acting. Um, so for me, this is some sort of calling that uh, eventually one day will end in um, the freedom of speech of all uh, high school students, uh, university students to, to study and practice all arts and especially uh, theater, which is the art of expression. Um, so that's where I'm, uh, that's my, my main motivation and my, uh, my goal, I would say professionally. So you're teaching, so just to make, make sure everybody understands, you're teaching these classes in the Arabic language. Yeah. So the students have to speak Arabic. So I'm assuming most of them, if not all of them, are Palestinians. All of them. All, all of them. For the past three years, all of them are either kindergarten teachers or teachers or headmasters or uh, members of, of uh, regional council that just need an, an extra course. Um, it's, it's the best time of my life. I love those courses. Uh, kindergarten teachers doing Shakespeare monologues in um, Arabic. Some of them choose to do it in Hebrew, like the other class, uh, the famous um, Shakespeare monologue from The Merchant of Venice. 
um, uh, has the Jew no eyes. Yeah. So one of the Palestinian kindergarten teachers took it. She was amazing. She made us cry. She's doing it with a very heavy Palestinian accent uh, in, but Hebrew. It, in Hebrew. And of course, it means it has suddenly it has an, uh, a double meaning. So my PhD would be eventually uh, a play composed of uh, students' works. Now you did some work you as an actor in Arabic, in Arabic countries too, didn't you? In Morocco mainly, yeah. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because um, somebody with your background having that kind of, uh, you know, that kind of uh, ability in Arabic is is unique. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sadly, sadly. I mean, uh, very sadly, yes, very sadly. Some of, a part of my research is exactly to find out how many people, how many Jews have dared to cross this line and to uh, practice Arabic, how many actors. And of course, there are some who made uh, amazing uh, work uh, from Ariel Elias in the 50s to uh, Julian Omer, who, who uh, practiced both languages and and some others. I mean, there, there may be 10. Uh, no, not more, but um, yeah, I mean, the play in Morocco was an initiative of a Moroccan uh, director called Rastan El Hakim, uh, whom I met in Paris. We act, we played together in a play in the Théâtre du Soleil, a famous theater in Paris. Uh, we didn't like the play that we did there <laughs> too much. I hope the director is not listening. But uh, we got uh, very, very friendly, and he told me he wants to put up a play in Morocco with me starring in it um, and, uh, by a, a Hebrew author called Hanoch Levin, which is uh, maybe the most known uh, Hebrew uh, playwright, uh, which is also very important because he was very politically um, explicit and uh, outspoken against the occupation, but also very much punished for it. We can talk about that later, but uh, this very famous play is actually the first Hebrew play to be uh, performed and produced in an Arab country. And so through that, we're trying to get uh, sufficient attention to get it imported to, uh, to Israel. Israel is the, um, the second largest, no, third largest country of Moroccan population in the world after Belgium and Morocco. Wow. So, and it's the biggest population in Israel. Like uh, Israel, Israel is composed out of Moroccans, then Polish, then Moroccan is the biggest uh, number of people. And uh, it used to be very strong with them, um, the theater, Moroccan theater. So, so Israelis who are descendants of Moroccans make up the majority of Israelis? Um, yeah, I mean, Moroccan immigrants make up the majority Morocco of that, that were basically bought by the Zionist movement from the Moroccan king, uh, who didn't want to give them away. Um, so, um, they immigrated and they, 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 they are in such big numbers. It's, a uh, it's, uh, it's one of the biggest apartheid paradox for me. You know, um, there was never a Moroccan Israeli, a Moroccan Jew as a head of anything, state or government or army or whatever, or of course, university. And so, I mean, the oppression based on color of skin and ethnicity is the same since, um, well, since the beginning of Israel. And uh, well, this experience in Morocco, two months of, uh, of touring, um, the play was uh, almost completely in the Moroccan dialect in Darija, um, which I've learned phonetically. I speak Palestinian Arabic and I've studied it uh, basically like a, a, an opera singer is studying the Italian text without speaking Italian. Uh, but after a month, I did start to um, to chat in uh, Moroccan. It's an amazing, lovely language, which is, uh, I think the one thing I loved about it most is that it's so mixed. Um, all different uh, occupations and colonizations are in it. Um, identities are everywhere. Like everybody in the cast, 14 people were all Moroccan, but many of them, Amazir, Berber, uh, I remember there was just one who said, I am Arabic in origin, because the, the Arab origins in Morocco go way back. Um, 
we were refused to bring it back. Miri Regev, which was the Ministry of Culture in Israel, a very um, dark and uh, sinister person, uh, racist as well, but also Moroccan who changed her name. Uh, so she uh, refused it. She didn't want to connect. But now our prime minister has uh, reconnected with Morocco. So maybe we could take advantage of that and bring the connections <laughs> over. I seriously doubt that, but we're yeah. trying. Silver lining. All right. Well, thank you for that. I've got lots more to ask you, but uh, in a little bit. Uh, Saleh, um, tell us a little bit about where you grew up and uh, how you started uh, theater. Um, you've made some movies that have become really well known internationally too. So I think people would be fascinated to hear about your background. Yeah, I was born in Jaffa, nearby the sea. And then the age of five, uh, we moved to a village in the north of Palestine in the Galilee called El Bane, uh, which is the village of my father. And there I grew up. And then in the, the high school, I did in Haifa. And then the study of theater I did in an Israeli uh, theater school. At that time, uh, maybe uh, a guy was uh, struggling how to get out of the, of the army. So he didn't teach me uh, theater in Arabic. I had to learn theater in Hebrew. Did you go to uh, high school in an Israeli high school? No, Palestinian high school. Palestinian high school in, in Albania or where? No, in Haifa. Oh, in Haifa, okay. In the ortho, uh, orthodoxy uh, high school in uh, oh. the orthodox. It's called the orthodox high school in, in, uh, in Haifa. Uh, it's like uh, uh, an independent high yeah, school. Uh, it used to be one of the best high schools. I didn't like it. <laughs> I didn't like it at all. I didn't like the high school. And anyway, I didn't like schools. I don't like uh, that how to call it. That makes it whatever. So yes, I studied in this uh, Israeli school. I studied in Hebrew. I used to love the, the you know, they teach you all kinds of diction and how to speak, how to speak Shakespeare in Hebrew and things like that. So I had to study poetry in Hebrew, and that's where I liked the language. Uh, I, uh, we studied um, uh, also the Torah in Hebrew for the um, acting purposes and diction purposes. And it was, for me, it was, um, it was interesting, and that's where I loved the Hebrew language. Um, and then um, after that, I worked in the Camry Theater, the Habima Theater, uh, two plays. And then I started to work in Arabic because I didn't want to work anymore there. And uh, yeah, until 2007, I did theater and then uh, and 2007 started to do cinema and since then I do cinema more than uh, more than theater um, unfortunately I love theater but it is very hard to do theater in Palestine it's uh, most of uh, we don't have we, we, we only have one independent Palestinian theater in Haifa and it's very small it's called uh, Khashabe theater uh, the only repertoire big theater that we had, Al Midan Theater, was closed, was shut down by the Miri Regev, the Moroccan who changed her name and, and became a very racist and sinister woman. So she closed, shut down our theater because we dared to talk about uh, the. Um, political prisoners in, in Palestine, uh, telling the story of Walid Dhaka uh, in a theater play. 
that he wrote, adapted from his writing. So she, they decided to shut it down, and since then it's 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 shut down. Sorry, uh, I do to... only I do only for now. I do only Palestinian cinema and cinema abroad. I in two thousand and. Uh, the, the last Israeli uh, theater play I have done, which was the fourth, was in Tumunah Theater. And it was uh, Shakespeare. And then I decided to leave and to stop working with the Israeli institutes, whether it is uh, theater or cinema. And... Uh, since then, I do only Palestinian theater and cinema, and I work abroad. In a way, uh, boycotting the Israeli institutes um, made me... In a way, I, 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 I condemned myself to uh, half an exile, let's say, because most of my life is abroad now. Uh, and I didn't, <laughs> I didn't uh, uh, think about it. I just felt that I, I cannot work anymore in this in this institute. I just Why? I what? cannot work. I just cannot work with people who doesn't believe in the right to return. Who doesn't believe in in um, inequality the way I see it. And I think equality um, cannot exist until we come back because equality you do with people who exist with you. You cannot do equality without the people. You get the people back and then you talk about equality. And then, uh, yes, the, since 2008, I don't, I don't work in the Israeli institutes. And since then, yeah, I declared it later on, but since then, yeah, 2008. And yeah, in a way, I'm, I'm happy in my exile, in my exile, in, uh, in my heart. My heart is relaxed because I don't do things that my heart doesn't accept or doesn't feel well with that, you know. And that's it. Now I'm writing uh, a play and, uh, you know, we have to find a way to create in such a place and uh, the writing is uh, I decided to start to write I out of crisis uh, because there is not a lot of work here and for me and uh, then I then I, I had to do something I had to create when I found myself when I'm here mostly when I'm Palestine when I am in Palestine mostly I am unemployed so I had to find ways to create and to do things that that I initiate and that's why I started to write and I found it very interesting and very I'm, I'm, I'm really passionate about it now, and it's my first play, and, and I'm happy about it. It's, um, right, it's my second Arabic. draft now. You're writing in Arabic. Writing in Arabic, yes. It's a play yeah. in Arabic. Yeah, 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 yeah. So you said, can I ask you, you said something about the Maidan and about Hamiri Geri. By the way, Miri Regev was the Minister of Culture, right? So yes. how did she close... What authority does she have to close down a theater because of a play that she doesn't agree with? I mean, she ha what kind of authority does she have to do that? I don't understand. Uh, I don't understand either. No. She doesn't. She doesn't. Um, and that's why officially she didn't, she couldn't close Almidan officially for uh, her uh, censorship claims. Um, she uh, started by saying that the theater can't speak about these 
uh, can't give a stage to a prisoner. And of course, that's not true. So um, the law did not allow her to close the theater for that. So she sent her clerks to look for um, problems in the financial administration of the theater. And then after two years of fighting and looking for holes and defunding and uh, preventing budgets from the municipality and from wherever to get to Avidan, they just completely suffocated it. Um, they, they, wanted, they, they, wanted, they wanted to give the money, but with conditions that they put. And then the Palestinians who were uh, responsible for, for the theater at that time didn't agree or didn't want to agree anymore for the conditions. They said, we are doing theater and we are free to do what we want as a Palestinian minority in, in Israel. We are free to do what we are doing theater and we, we want to be free to do whatever we want. And that is not acceptable in Israel. There are three taboos that you cannot touch when you get money from Israel. The army, you never talk about refusals. You never deal with refusing army. Uh, you never deal with, uh, with uh, uh, there are two other conditions that is related to, to, the, to giving money that you have to sign on you have to sign it. But one of the main things is the army, is the security and the army. And then the Palestinians didn't want these conditions anymore. They don't want to sign these papers. Just, this is our right to get this money. We pay taxes and you don't shut the theater down because of what we think and what we want to say. And that's why it shuts down because they didn't want to sign these conditions. And just to clarify to everybody, we're talking about Haifa, which is in what they, you know, they like to call Israel proper, which is supposedly a democracy with, uh, you know, open mind and liberal values and free speech and so on. So this is just, if anybody in the audience is not clear about that, um, I just wanted to clarify that. Yeah, maybe but, about conditions, no? I'm sorry? The conditions, these conditions that were posed uh, to the Yelmidan administration or to any other Palestinian artist is, uh, I mean, Miri Regev went on to harass other artists like uh, Tamer Nafar, the rapper. She really targeted him. And the conditions are basically, um, you can't uh, deny the, um, you can't uh, mention that that's the, in the law actually right now. You can't mention Israeli establishment in 1948 as a catastrophe. You cannot mention the Nakba, which is the Palestinian catastrophe of the creation of Israel. Yeah. So these are in the law today, and these are parts of uh, the conditions. So of course, they can't accept it. So, Guy, I want to go back to you and your work and. Um... Something you said to me many years ago, which was that um, um, you see yourself less as a, you'd like to see yourself, and I'm paraphrasing, but you'd like to see yourself less as a colonizer and more as an immigrant in terms yeah. of your, your existence in Palestine. And I, I love that. I quote that. Uh, a lot, and I use that a lot. I think it's excellent, and I uh, one day when I come back to Palestine, I will adopt that myself because I think it's I think it's refreshing. So, can you talk a little bit about that, and then you want to share something, right, on the screen? Yep. And then I want to ask you also about the play that you had that was not allowed to be shown in a festival. Maybe you can talk about that as well. Yeah, so um, about the notion of immigrating instead of colonizing, it's a very uh, naive notion that I um, 
that I like for its naiveness. I mean, uh, I think uh, naivety or naiveness, I don't know how you say naivety, is a very important part of art and of culture. The, the ability to, um, to, have, to have the permission and the ability to, to just act as human. Um, and uh, one act as human that uh, Israelis, Jews should have done, like any other a person that immigrates into another country is to um, integrate and assimilate like immigrants do everywhere else in the world. But the, uh, uh, the, the Zionists came here with such um, arrogance that they have rejected the welcoming gestures that happened from the Palestinian side for for, for years before the creation of the state. The first encounter of Zionists with Palestinians was of welcoming. Welcoming uh, in front of the Turks that uh, were here and then against the British. Um, yeah, and there then, were two villages, like two Jewish villages in the first beginning of the 19th century for immigrants who came, for Jewish immigrants who came from Russia and before that. So uh, there were no, the Palestinians welcomed uh, the Jewish refugees as the Armenian, as the others. Every uh, refugees were welcomed. That's for sure, yeah, sorry. Yeah, no, no, that, that's, that's exactly, um, I mean, I'm reading a very interesting book about it right now. It's called From Shared Life to Co-Resistance in historic Palestine. So that's basically what they talk about, uh, that people used to immigrate here. I mean, my grandmother, my, who passed away this year, um, she was the seventh generation in Israel, in Palestine. Seventh generation, which makes me the ninth and my son the tenth. Um, and she came here after, I mean, she didn't, but her ancestors came to Palestine, to Jerusalem, after pogroms in Lithuania. And of course they were welcomed. Uh, she, she practically spoke Arabic without knowing she speaks Arabic. That's the way she used to make her grocery shopping in the market. But um, so this reality of uh, integration and assimilation into the Palestinian, into the local scene was something that happened here. And when I came back to, to Palestine from France, I thought this was an opportunity. Um, as, as far as raising kids go, because I knew that um, I am going to have kids and I'm not going to grow to let them grow up in the Israeli system or in the Israeli community, in the homogenic. Um, I grew up in a homogenic and also um, all white um, neighborhood. I remember I met the, the first um, Arab Jews, like when I was a teenager. So this, if this is not apartheid, this is something, so apartheid is still here. I mean, you can grow your children, grow, no, uh, how do you say it? Raise children. You can raise your children completely without hearing a word in Arabic. In Ra'anana, in North Tel Aviv, in the kibbutz. You can completely spare them from, and th this is the colonial experience and I want to do something else. So my children both speak Arabic. They're in a bilingual uh, school, one of four bilingual schools in Israel. Um, they speak fluently, they study uh, literary Arabic, they read, they write, they study arithmetic in Arabic or sports or whatever. They, they, they do everything together. The classes are half and half. Um, so for me, this is the future and I'm making it the present. I'm spending my days, my week, uh, choosing to buy my groceries in Arabic, to pick up a package from the post in Arabic, to fill up gas in my car in Arabic. It's something that you actually can do. Israel, Palestine is a mixed country. It's all about narratives of what you choose to believe. Um, so I'm, I don't think I'm actually immigrating to Palestine because um, Israel is in power and a very cruel and violent power which I am um, a part of, even if I don't want to. 
Um, I pay taxes. These taxes go to the army, and the army shoots uh, phosphorus on Palestinian schools. This comes from my paycheck. Um, not only my paycheck, every Palestinian that works is also financing it. So we cannot boycott ourselves. I think the whole approach of boycott from within and um, the different approaches of what uh, 1948 Palestinians or people from historic Palestine should do as far as uh, boycott, divestment and sanction go. Um, for Al-Midan's story, for example, Al-Midan was financed by uh, taxpayers' money, but these are the taxes that the actors and directors and audiences pay. Uh, Palestinians in Israel work in hospitals, in the courtrooms, in everywhere. There's not a place, and I'm talking about these higher places, of course, the lower uh, socioeconomical uh, positions are also um, uh, filled by Palestinians. So there is really no way of escaping it. This is a, a binational state, a multicultural state, and that's the present, the past, and the future. Um, it's only a question, when will they all get it? So I'm basically thinking about in terms of islands of peace. Like, I don't have the pretension of, uh, I don't think the Middle East will have peace with these leaders anytime soon, with these kinds of leaders. But I think we, and especially in these time of blockade and all these, is there something very liberating, knowing that we don't need the state so much. We have a community. We get along. Uh, the Palestinian neighbors I have here on the street are the first that my son sees uh, when he wakes up to this not vacation curfew and he's the one that they're going to, to play together immediately. So our community is the most important thing we can create. Uh, states come and go, empires fall. Amen. Um, do you want to talk about that? Uh, well, hold on, let's go back to that. I will, I'll go back, I'll go to, uh, to Saleh. I want to ask you something. Um, in the movie Wajib, at the end of the movie, there's a scene, and if anybody hasn't seen the movie Wajib, by the way, I know that uh, Anne Marie Jessen is in the uh, is is in the audience here, um, and Roger Waters is here too, and he says he loves your work, Saleh. Um, Thank I, you, Roger. So at the end at the end of the movie, there's a, a conflict between you and and the, your father, you're both driving in the car and, and, and it's really your father, it's, it's Muhammad Bakri who's really your father. Can you talk about what happens at the end and what that conflict is about and what happens, what happens there? At the very end. I think that what happens there is a father-son love that wins the battle, that is more strong than the, the political arguments between both of them and other arguments. Uh, it's a love and son, it's a father and son love story and it wins at the end. This is my, uh, how I see it. Regarding the, the boycott from within uh, that guy talked about it, I, I never, when I, when I decided to boycott, I didn't declare that I'm part of the boycott within or I'm part of the boycott appeal. It's just what I felt just the, what my heart told me, and I followed my heart. Now, when we talk about culture, it's different. Culture, you can still, you can still find a way to say no to 
conditions and to be free in culture. Now, of course, Al-Midan Theater takes money from Israel and I'm not against working with Al-Midan Theater because Al-Midan Theater is a platform where, where you can make culture locally. And it's very important to me to work in municipalities like uh, Palestinian municipalities like a guy do in all kinds of uh, cultural centers that is uh, funded by, by, by Israel in the Palestinian communities. Of course, I do this stuff and uh, I don't boycott the local cultural Palestinian uh, institutes, even if they get money, they get money from Israel. But I do boycott uh, institutes that, that use me and my photo and my voice and my, and my face to represent Israel as a beautiful democratic country in the world. That's, that's where I boycott. So let's be clear about that. And I have to be clear about that uh, guy because boycott from within, inside, you can find a way where you can in the same time hit and in the same time doesn't uh, uh, um, um, uh, uh, stop yourself, doesn't uh, limit yourself from, doesn't separate yourself from your audience. I don't need to go to uh, the Israeli TV to be in, ac in contact with my audience. I don't need to go to the, Isra uh, to the Israeli cinema to be in contact with my audience, the opposite. I need to go to Al Midan to be in contact with my audience. And yes, my audience needs me. They need me. And I need them. And, and the fact that it is, the fact we are separated makes it very, very difficult to create. I agree, very difficult to, to, to make a Palestinian culture in, in, in a very, you know, collective way. Well, it's a dream. It's a dream to, to make, an, to make a, a, a play where people from Gaza and from, uh, and from the West Bank and ex-refugees are sitting in front of me. Of course, it's a, it's a dream. I dream about that. But it doesn't exist. So, uh, so yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm trying to do my best doing theater here and that's why i'm writing now maybe i would succeed to someday maybe also uh, produce produce things that i'm writing here from money from abroad or the arab world i don't know but not from uh, from a country who occupies me and when i want to resist they want to pay me for my resistance that's a joke. You know, Saleh, when you said you don't want them to use your voice and your face in your photo, it reminds me, I uh, interviewed an old uh, Naturikata rabbi in New York a while ago. I went to meet with him. His name is Rabbi Beck. And he left uh, Jerusalem when he was young after the 1967 war. And I asked him, and he is very old. He's a very old man by now. He's still alive. I asked him, why would an Orthodox Jewish rabbi leave Jerusalem? And after 1967, you know, the Kotel was suddenly available and all this. And he sat and he, doesn't, he speaks Yiddish. So through another rabbi who was helping to translate, and he was kind of doing this with his beard. And he said, I don't want them to crown their state with my beard and my payas. And my coffin, you know, the special <laughs> coat that he wears. Yeah. He to crown their state with these. And it's so similar in a way, you know, he couldn't stand this, what's going on in Palestine. 
especially after 1967. But I want to go back to Wajib, if you don't mind. And the reason I raised that particular point, because at the end, there is, there is, uh, you know, there's one invitation, wedding invitation, that you actually storm out of the car. And you say, I cannot give this person an invitation to my sister's wedding. And the reason I'm pushing on this is because I think it's something that, first of all, people don't understand that exists. And it's this, the existence, this prevalence of the secret police, the Shabak, in the life of Palestinians in so many ways, which is why I bring it up because it's such a powerful moment because you bring up something, the two of you are there and you bring up this very, very, very important, important aspect of that life. So could you please talk about that just a little bit more about that particular invitation, the person who you, the two of you are discussing and why you are so angry and why is it that he thinks that person yeah. should be invited? Yeah, it's, it's um, half of it. Of course, all what we do and of course what Anne-Marie Jasser is doing is trying to make something of the experience of the people, make something out of it creatively. And it's the experience of the people we meet, the experience of the people we know. And it's out of our reality. And in this specific story, it's related to a very nice cultural uh, uh, place that a group of young people about 15 to 18 years ago, they opened like a cinematic with a bar, with a, a big library. And it was very, it was open for everybody in the middle of uh, Nazareth, the old city. And it was something for me. I used to go from Haifa or wherever I was to, to uh, Nazareth just to be with the, with the guys, with the Shabab, and drink some Arak, very cheap. Sometimes if you have money, you pay. If you don't have money, you don't pay. Uh, my father, by the way, uh, uh, performed there. The, his one man, famous one man show, uh, The Optimist, he performed, performed it there. Habibi. And one day they closed it, they shut it down. The Shabak shut this place down. And a lot of the guys were in the Shabak and they met the, their, uh, their, uh, their uh, life hell to, just to, to shut it down. So they shut it down at the end. At the end, they succeeded to separate the guys and to shut it down. So it is, in a way, from there, for the, this story of, the, of, of this place is, is there in this story of the fight between the father and the son. Because the son just opened uh, a, 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 a cinematic like that, like very simple cinematic in, in, uh, in Jerusalem, at what, in, in uh, in, uh, in Nazareth, in the old city. And it was very political and they were active politically and, and culturally and they, and they shut the, the place down and he was interrogated in the, in the, uh, with the Shabak. So, so this man is related to the interrogation. The man who shut uh, my character's uh, cultural center is the man who is invited to the wedding. And it's so personal. It's not only an idea. It's not only a, an ideology. It's personal. So that's why it's very um, heated uh, conflict uh, scene and a, a big fight between them because the father knows that this guy, his son's dream was shut down because of this man who is going to be uh, a guest in the wedding. 
That's the absurdity of living here. And why does the father want to invite him? Why does the father insist to invite him? He wants to apparently take care. He is afraid about his son. Maybe his son will come back. Maybe if he is a friend with, with this guy, his son will come back from Italy and will be with him. Maybe he will, will forget about his son and about his son ideas. Maybe, maybe things like that happen, you know. And he wants to get promoted in, <laughs> in the school. He wants to be the manager of the school. So he thought maybe I get promoted and I get my son back. So this is, yeah, it's like the, the, the surviving, the surviving issue for the Palestinians who live here it is so strong in this film. It's so, uh, it's, it's depicted so, so deeply and so simply and, and beautiful. Yeah, thank you. Well, thank you for that. I know it's I know it's personal. I know it's difficult, and I know it's not just art, like you say. It's the real life. It's real life. Everything that's depicted is real life, and uh, the movie is 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 exceptional. But thank you for clarifying. My father used to. <laughs> my father had a problem. <laughs> my my father used to say. I am like the son. I'm not like the father. Why you do? <laughs> Why do you give me? He used to I'm be angry talk, about I'll that. Be yeah. to he had a problem with this scene, especially. Oh, really? Yes. I'm going to be talking to him in, uh, next week or in two weeks as well. Very nice. So Very nice. We'll talk yeah, about Yeah, now, now it's, it's, it's good. It's, it's also a good moment to talk about him because of the Janine case. Also, it's, uh, yes. he's in the middle of a big struggle now. We are all with him, of course. And uh, all we... We already won the battle, my friend. Since oh, the yeah. first, since the think. first uh, 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 censorship, uh, we already won the battle because it's just exposed the the ugliness of this institute called Israel, of this system called Israel. Just exposed it, but, but in a very big way and. And I hope, I hope that, that people around us in the Arab world would appreciate art uh, as much as, uh, and give it the, the, the weight it has as much as the, 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 this system with all its ugliness appreciating because if they don't appreciate this art they wouldn't they wouldn't do all this battle with my father they wouldn't do this battle if they didn't know the meaning of culture and art if they didn't really uh, appreciate that so i hope uh, that we would be able to create maybe a palestinian um, uh, fund for all Palestinians here, including my father, uh, to help. Maybe, maybe this uh, trial against my father and against the film, maybe would be an uh, opportunity to sit and think together, how can we create a fund that can really um, support all Palestinian actors and artists who live in this place this is this is really a hope you know i think i agree with you that you won and from another aspect that i mean which is that the fact that they banned the movie has created much more interest and since this ban came out until today all over social media you see people talking about it and watching it and the link is in the chat. There's a free link where you can watch it on Vimeo. I know I watched it at least twice since then. I wrote an article. I, I did a little uh, video. I'm going to be interviewing your father. We're talking about it now. More and more and more people are watching this movie. 
and uh, the stupidity of of, of uh, boycotting a movie is is, a, is 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 apparent. But on top of that stupidity, they're also giving more publicity to the movie anyway. Yeah, you know that's I mean? right. Um, and it's interesting to see what will happen with the Supreme Court, what they decide to do, if they decide. They, they, they succeeded in one thing, my friend. They, in, they succeeded in one thing, preventing this man, my father, from talking to the Israeli audience and to the Israeli people. Because he is maybe one of the best Palestinian figures who spoke to the Israeli ordinary uh, citizen and touch their hearts. I used to, when, when he was in, in the trial uh, years ago, I used to walk with him in the, once we walked in, in, in uh, Shuk HaKarmel in Tel Aviv, which is like Israeli market for vegetables, whatever. And people know him. And they would shout to him in the middle of the, while he was walking, Muhammad, stop doing, uh, stop, uh, stop, uh, stop with the politics. Come on, you are a great actor, stop with the politics. They know him and they love him. And they don't want him to speak to these people. They want to shut this voice down because he's not a politician. He's an artist, and he's a great artist. Yes, and uh, say, um, and um, well, and guy, I, I want to talk to you about your speaking of things that are banned. You know, your 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 play. What is it called? Beyond the abyss, on the edge of the abyss. Yeah, but before you go there, I want to say something about Janine. Janine, please, yeah, please do. It is, it is one of the most beautiful films I saw. Um, and I think uh, Saleh has, um, is completely right saying that uh, the, this uh, censorship, this persecution of Muhammad only shows the appreciation. Um, I would like to, to remind a scene from the film where Muhammad, is, like Saleh says, Muhammad is not only loved and known, the most loved and known actor, Palestinian actor in the Israeli audience, but probably also in the Palestinian audience. And when he's walking in Janine, he's walking into a crowd, and in the middle of the crowd, there's a man selling shoes. And the man is taking a shoe and pretending it to be a phone, talking to Condoleezza Rice. And he's making all the audience laugh in the film. It's so, it's so beautiful. And you have to be Muhammad Bakri to get so intimate. So as a, as a documentary artist, this should be praised. But this whole uh, campaign is, um, is basically, just like Saleh says, it's showing that Israel is not a democracy. It is using the most uh, ancient tools of silencing that don't work, of course, because people see it much more. And people, because of this censorship, people will eventually study Janin Janin in Israeli high schools. You know, in, in, in a few years, who knows? But uh, well, I'll just throw one more thing before we talk about your play, also about Janin, but I think it's relevant to your play as well. Um, I think that, uh, and by the way, there was an interview on uh, Instagram, Instagram Live with your father, Mohammed Bakri. Ion Palestine did, and Adam, uh, your brother Adam, did the uh, you know ask the questions. It's a lovely interview, by the way. You talk I about father son love, uh, uh, love relationship. So nice. It's beautiful. Yeah. But your father says that he took a cab at one point. He went back to Janine, and the Palestinian cab driver was from the camp, and he said to him, "What's the matter with you? You didn't show anything in your movie. You barely showed one percent of what is what actually happened." So you know the difference between the. The, the perception, but also that I think in this movie he touched something that is taboo. And you talked about that a little bit, Saleh, how you're not allowed to talk about, you know, for example, the military and refusing. Here he talked, he showed the military committing crimes. And Israelis, if they opened up to that, you know, Israel was founded on war crimes. 1948, which is the most important uh, part of the Israeli mythology, 
which we learn it, you know, my father, guy's grandfather was an officer. We learn it as heroism. It was all one big, horrible atrocity. Janine is just one small incident compared to 1948. And he, and there's no way Israelis can accept this, I think, because it exposes the worst side of, of the worst secret, if you will, of what it means to be Israel. And I think, Guy, your movie, the, I didn't see much. I just saw the little bit that you showed me. But I think it exposes a side that Israelis don't want to see. They don't want to be a part of. And that's why they're going to shut it down because that's not something they want to show. I didn't so, know they, they banned your uh, play, uh, Guy. Yeah. Sorry yeah. about that. So Sorry please talk that. about that and um, go ahead. So my play at the edge of the abyss was basically... Um, targeting exactly what you talk about, Miko, their inability to hear and to be aware of certain uh, information. Um, I was doing it in uh, the Tel Aviv University. My plays are usually supported by universities and uh, denied by theaters. So the Tel Aviv University pushed me to, uh, to try and see how much atrocities can the Hebrew language bear today on stage. And so I went to the National Bureau of Statistics and got uh, several stories eventually ended up in six stories of uh, uh, suicide patterns. Suicide patterns in historic Palestine, AKA State of Israel. Um, and um, from uh, ma many su uh, soldier suicides, which Israel is very uh, uh, big on uh, numbers of the, the soldiers committing suicides to uh, su uh, suicide by cop or by soldier. The phenomenon that started uh, a few years ago of basically uh, begging uh, an armed officer, an armed soldier to, to kill uh, by just by using the magic words, uh, Allahu Akbar, which means God is great but for Israelis means I'm going to kill you now. So we have many uh, incidents, to, you know, everything is, is uh, filmed um, of uh, young children going up with a pair of, with a pen or a pair of scissors saying Allah Akbar. And of course the soldiers don't hesitate to shoot them and kill them. There's a 12 year old girl, there's a 16 year old girl. I didn't go there. I took a 19 year old uh, girl from Nazareth who committed suicide in a uh, uh, central bus station and by doing exactly that. And the video shows that. And then I reenacted the video on stage. Uh, this is what the artistic committee of the Akko Fringe Festival couldn't stand. Um, the Akko Fringe Festival is the only... The Fringe Festival couldn't stand. French Festival is the only French festival in Israel. And... Um, at the end of a hearing, the, the, the play was accepted, which was a, a completely surprised me. I presented seven political bilingual plays to the ACO Festival seven years before, and they were all rejected. And this time it was accepted. Um, and they thought this subject is important because youth, it's mainly about youth. It tells the story of six people, three Israelis and three Palestinians um, in a service taxi which is the most common way people commute in the Middle East. Um, and so this service taxi that goes from Tel Aviv to Haifa um, has the, the six stories. Of course, not all political. Some of them are what we call here social, you know, not political. When, if it doesn't have anything to do with Palestinians, it's social. So I remember the, the one lady in the artistic committee yelling at me, what is this terrorist doing at the end of the play? What does she have anything to do with it? It's like, I don't have any terrorists in my play. I have a girl who's studying, was studying social work in, uh, in Nazareth and uh, killed herself. There's no, I, many people shot her. Many soldiers and policemen are running to shoot her, this uh, helpless young uh, girl. So it was obvious that they had this um, fear 
she said, uh, this, this makes your whole play political. So of course I said, what isn't political here? And then I was addressed by one person that I don't want to say his name. I don't want to, um, to slander uh, a Palestinian member of the artistic committee who looked at me in the eyes and said, Guy Dachilak, erase the text. We'll write a new one about suicide together. And I was like, nope, I will not erase the text. And so the, the manager of the theater festival said, okay, you're out. And this is after three months of preparing, spending money, spent more than $10,000 $10, on preparing that. And then the whole question of suing them or whatever, I didn't uh, pursue that yet. But uh, yeah, I would love to share like the trailer of the play. Please. And that has also a, a bit of an interview of the uh, director of the artistic committee who says that this is a festival of freedom. They will never censor anything. Just to say that uh, this is not the first time they censor a political play. There, are there subtitles? I didn't know yeah. this one. Okay. Yeah. So um, yeah, here we go. Share screen. Share sound. Okay. הפסטיבל הזה כבר, כן? כי זה פסטיבל של חופש. זה לא עוד פסטיבל, זה פסטיבל של חופש. למרות הדברים האלה, מפי המחזאי גיא אלחנן נשמעו טענות כאילו ההצגה שהגיש על פי תהום נפסלה על רקע פוליטי, אחרי שאושרה. מה הוא אמר לך? 
תתאס למילי? אני חושבת שהיית אפילו מסוגלת לשתות מתוך הגולגולת שלך. היית מאושרת לרחוץ את רגליי בתוך החזה השסוע שלך. את רוצה שאני אעבור? לא, למה? לא יודע, הרגשה כזאת. הרגשה כזאת? אתה לא חייב לי כלום, תשאר! אל תפחד ממני! תגידי! נו! איך חיילים ישנים באוטובוסים? פיטר, שירשמו על התאונה. חשבתי עוד התאבדות בארצות זאת אומרת, איך הם נרדמים בכלל? את יודעת כמה פעמים נרדם עליי חייל? באמת שאני לא מפחידה. ואני תקוע עם הנשק שלו? הצור שלי, שגדל ברמאללה, סיפר לי איך כילדים הם היו מכינים את הנטע האלה ושמים באמצע העיר כדי לשגע את כולם. הוא סיפר לי איך... דוחפים ידיים לשיער. ואני בקבוק. חוטי חשמל יוצאים ממנו, אשכרה ככה, כמו סדר פרחים, בגלגל. עצרה בכיכר של הרעיון בלב רמאללה ובלאגן. משטרה פלסטינית ידעו מהצבא מגיע. הוא סיפר לי שפעם אחת הג'יפ רדף אחריו, ושהיה ברצון לראות. איך אפשר לראות עם הקסטה הזאת על הפנים? עם בלונים טבעוניים, במסטיקים מתוקים, ועצי ריח. בכלבים שיעננו לך על הדשבורד. ישב בלמחניק צעיר. רוצה שתסדרי את הארנונה, תביאי את הצ'קים, תגיעי ב-11 לאכול. לכל הסבל. לפה, לפה, לפה! לחיפה, לבית הקרונות, שם! מותק, אין עצבים! בוא נלך בטוב, שייקח מונית, מה אני הנהגת שלו? הוא לא יוסיף לי כסף, אבל הוא כן יוסיף לי זמן. ועכשיו נחים. אחרי שצפתה בווידאו של ההצגה, שמלווה דמויות מהשוליים של החברה הישראלית בנסיעה לילית במונית שירות, החליטה הוועדה לדחות את ההצגה. הכל קורה במונית, כולם עוברים. טוב, לא כולם. אתה לא. אבל And so um, I didn't think that I would get funded by the Israeli establishment, and that's why I always insist on presenting political plays. Um, but um, but the, uh, the paradox is that this play had sold tickets in advance uh, For the amount of 10,000 euros that help, uh, help us, uh, $10,000, something like that, help us tour. And the people came, people wanted to see the play. Actually, more than 60 people in Haifa had paid for the tickets and didn't get to see the play. It never reached Haifa because El Midan was closed. After El Midan was closed, there was uh, some other options. And I, I said, I don't want to... to produce a play without paying the actors anymore. Like I didn't have any money and everybody wanted to volunteer. Everybody, the people who worked with us, who helped us transport the decor from Jerusalem to Haifa to Tel Aviv, nobody wanted money except the theaters, you know, but I'm, I was like, no, I want to pay actors well. So I had this wonderful actress. The actors you see there are students, uh, So I had this wonderful professional actress who wanted to play it for free. And I said, I told her, Yolanda, no, I don't want to. I want to work with you like we're supposed to work for hours, not worrying about if we're getting paid or if we should use this time to get to work. So it's like uh, Saleh said, it's completely impossible to do theater here. 
if you're not uh, supported from the outside by some sort of fund, some sort of impartial. Um, and that's why I went to do my PhD abroad um, in England because uh, and this play this play was like the first time I I dared to face the Hebrew language to write in Hebrew since I uh, left the army. <clears throat> Excuse me. I want to ask you something about the uh, the, the term. Um... The, uh, how did she say it? The underworld kingdom of children or something like that? Sub Subterranean kingdom of children. This is a, <clears throat> this is a quotation of my uh, mother. Um, who actually speaks a lot about, uh, about that, uh, using that term to speak about all the children that already they already died that are underneath us and that keep dying. Um, they divide it into, uh, into different reasons, yeah? Some are political and some are not. I mean, if you look at statistics and you see how many people are killed in Israel in car accidents, and you're like, yeah, but that's not political. But then you see settler roads, settler roads who have five, six lanes and no car on them. And the road leading from the north to the south has two lanes. So whenever you want to bypass a truck, you get killed. So there are more dead in Israel from suicides, from car accidents, from... And, and, and they're managing to, to convince us that this is normal. This, this is what happens, you know, in, in any country. But uh, in this play, what I tried to do, and I think I did a lot of work on it to make it clear, but I tried to say that, you know, 30 Palestinians of Israeli citizenship, this is my, this is the, the play I did before, 30 Palestinians die a year falling down scaffoldings. Because they I drop fall down. Up. I fall down, I broke my, my hip when so I was like... Uh, working building that's right so that's that's exactly by the way the same number of suicide soldiers per, per year so you've got about 60 young people that die every year those building buildings you know israel is all about building so of course regulations of safety are the the least of israeli law uh, worries especially when it comes to palestinians or recently chinese workers that are imported and you know, most of the soldiers that are suic the, that suicide that are not reported as suicide. This is also in the play. They don't want to get it into their statistics. So they report it as an accident. And um, I mean, there's this girl there, she's playing um, a border police who is running away from her commander because he was raping her. And, and these things infiltrate every aspect of the Israeli society. Now, I, I don't think Israeli society or any other society should be pure of terrible things, you know? Um, a commander uh, sexually harassing his, uh, his, his younger uh, soldiers is something that happens everywhere, I'm sure. But being able to not connect this to the reality to the occupation, to the continuing violence. I mean, we have we have good kids that go to Cyprus and rape a girl, you know, Israeli kids, and then the whole system in Israel is enlisted to clear their name. And then it happens again and again, and it's so normal. Violence is everywhere here, and it's promoted, and it's a, it's like it's as if it's the ideology. The ideology of this place is being ignorant, is being violent, is being um, sexist. It's, it's um, I mean, and this is not only Israel. This is probably, you can say that about many, many places. But Israel has this endless market going on with the West, with the, especially with the United States, buying weapons, 
trying weapons, now trying uh, Corona vaccine for the rest of the world. You know, Netanyahu boasting that we're the first, we're the guinea pigs. You know, they try it on us. Like, just like they try the weapons, we try their weapons on Palestinians so they could buy it later. Um, this thing, this uh, hug, this terrible hug that we get from the, the, uh, the world weapon industry is, is, is killing us. And, and I mean, there's nothing I want more. I remember Saleh, I remember very fondly that I, uh, just when I got to Haifa, I went to uh, a class, a one-on-one -on -one acting class with Saleh. And I felt like I'm back in Paris for a few hours in a neutral place. I'm just doing theater. That's it. And the Arabic became not a political uh, decision that I've made, just something that I like to work with, language and stage and all these normal stuff that I was um, lucky enough to, to have a bit of in, in France when I studied. But ever since, it's just a struggle. You struggle for every rehearsal, for every text you memorize. It's, uh, it's not the way it should be. And, and I mean, right now with the Corona blockade, um, actors, Israeli actors were, were um, very upset that theaters are closed and they don't have jobs. And I was, I was thinking, yeah, they're right, you know, but people don't understand or the state refuses to understand the value of art to the society. And for me, the fact, it's not only that they don't have work now in theaters, it's also that uh, when they did have work, they did shit. In Habima, in Akamari, the National Theater Salah spoke about. It's very rare to find something good. It's a very rotten system that doesn't seek to be any better because it supports. That's the way it's supported. If it would make good theater, people would not be so violent, would not rush to the army as if it's something that would benefit them in any way. People are supposed to avoid the army. People are supposed to cut off their fingers so they won't be able to press the gun. That's normal human behavior. We don't have that. Wow, gentlemen, I have to tell you, this is, uh, we can go on like this for hours and hours. We should probably open it up to um, the Q&A. Jamil, do you want to uh, pick a few? Like we're way, way over the time, but let's pick maybe two questions. Sure. So this one is from uh, Isadora. The question is, I am 17 and half Iraqi living in New York City. I hope to make documentary films about underrepresented narratives that are often eclipsed in American media and beyond. My question is, what pitfalls do you see in making films or art about the Arab world for a Western audience? What, what? I didn't understand. What difficulties easy, are Easy, what easy, easy. Keep it easy, simply. What kind of problems will she face if she's trying to make movies, documentaries about the Arab world in, in, to a Western audience? I think it's hard for us to say, since we're not a Western audience, we're not, um, but I think um, facing difficulties would be, um, ignorance would be the biggest difficulty. I think when you're handling these kind of reality issues, you have to prepare yourself to, um, to know about it, to speak about it beyond your work because people don't know anything. But yeah. Saleh, yo, a lot of your work, the movies that you make are for Western audiences, no? Yeah. I, I don't know how to answer because I don't, I, I really don't know how to answer this question, but I would say that do what you believe and what you feel and then you learn by yourself how to deal because when 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 i do something when i'm writing now my play i i don't think of how pe the people or the audience would perceive it i think of 
like my 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 vision for my play is that I can is that I can uh, perform it in England or in or in Broadway in, in New York and in the same time in the village in uh, here in, in in the north of Palestine and my aim is that people integrate with it and interact with it everywhere I, I, I do it. This is my aim. Now, what people would think if they love it, don't love it. You always do things that people love. You find people who love and you find people who don't love. It, this is, you do what you believe and that's it. That's a good answer. Hey, here, another question. This one is from Evelyn. This is for Saleh. How can we in America help your father? So this is about the Janine Janine censorship. Uh, thank you. Uh, actually, we, we, we thought at the beginning to raise an appeal of donation on the net. And then we decided not to do that. Um, and to ask uh, some people who can afford and can help some people personally, who can afford and can help. And we thought maybe it's better to, to use this, um, this case and try to make a fund, like I said before, for all Palestinians, because it's not only the case of Muhammad Bakri, it's the case of everybody here. And uh, maybe we can, maybe we can do this. Uh, thank you very much. I, I really appreciate that. I'm sure my father appreciates that too. There is a petition though, right? People can, there's a petition that people can sign. There is a petition, yes. There is a petition you can, you can sign. And is it on the be, chat? That would be. Uh, the petition is on the chat. So if wants. I, I did link it in the chat, and then in the post uh, event email, I'll make sure the petition is 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 in there as well, as well as the yeah. link to watch Janine Janine. You should probably also just watch the film if you haven't seen it already. And thank you so much. You want to do one more, or, or yeah, let's do one last one, yeah. okay? This one is from Lori. The question is: Where do both of you look to for inspiration for your work? when the conditions there don't seem to change much. I'm an actress, so I know we can always hope. However, I don't live with the occupation. Reality. Reality. My, my, my reality, my, my experience in life in, in here, in, in where I grew up, where I was born, the people I've met, the people I grew up with, um, the people, the, my friends, the people that are that are in, the, the people who are living around me and and here, the, the, these are my inspiration for what I do. I'm people who are interested me this is the, the relationships the relationships with people uh, is, is uh, are, are the most interesting for me and that's where that's where I get my inspiration from this is at least my my experience with writing now and this is my first experience so I don't know maybe there are other inspirations from somewhere else but for now only people that I that I know personally yeah, I, I have to agree. I mean, I have the uh, same source of inspiration and I think reality here is a great source of inspiration as it is in any place, but there's something about the warmth of people here in general. Uh, they're very generous. People are give their story, give their, they show you what they experience. You just have to ask, you know, pay attention. So I think it's, an, it's a very uh, fruitful reality to and that will always inspire. Um, and I, I, you know, I can't wait for the day that we could just be inspired by people's stories here 
and not feel the obligation to include um, harsher parts of it. You know, someone just wrote this stupid remark about politics in theater. Someone said that uh, putting politics in theater is like shooting a cannon inside of a concert hall. And I would love to be in a concert hall that involves a cannon. You know, I think that would be really cool. So, I mean, this is the thing is, well, you, you touch this political and they all get like, ah, but, um, and you know, we all want to write a love story that there's a song by Tamar Nafar, the, the rapper I mentioned before. He says, I would love to write you love stories, but they're all in the love poems, but they're all in the drawer. They're all in the drawer because I can't stop this speaking about the wall and these walls and I'm create while I speak about these walls, I'm creating a wall between me and you. It's a beautiful song called Yaret um, from the uh, Udi Aloni film, uh, Junction 48. Yeah. So, I mean, th this is where, this is where we are. We don't lack inspiration, but we lack, um, you know, freedom um, just to be let go, you know? Don't don't support us, you know, Miri Regev or whoever. Don't give us your money. No need. But don't shut us down. Don't you know? Don't imprison us. Don't don't send your secret service to shut down a a, a, a cinema in Nazareth. And get away. Say, I would say to the people, don't vote for Miri Regev. Don't vote for a political party that includes Miri Regev. If you want good theater, if you want people like these two incredible artists to create for you. They need to survive, and they can't survive if you vote for an idiot racist like Peter Regev, you know, or a political party that accepts her. That's exactly it. And that's why you have the bloodshed and the sad stories instead of the, and the walls instead of the love story. Am I right? Completely. Gentlemen, I can't thank you enough. This was wonderful and inspiring. I love you both very, very much. Thank and, you, Miko. Um, have a good evening, and uh, this will be... This will be available on mikopel.com, on my Facebook page. If you want to share it, feel free. I can't thank you enough for your time and your incredible knowledge and experience sharing it with everybody. So have a wonderful evening. Inshallah, I'll see you soon. Thank you so much, Miko. Take care. See you soon, guy. I hope. Bye-bye. See you.